I address this pretty pronto in my book, in the introduction, uh, that actually being anti-racist is not about being an ally, it's about being a better human being. It's about treating, specifically in my lens, treating black people uh, with basic dig dignity, care and respect, which are all the things that didn't happen to us historically and to this very day for many of us still. To kick things off, for people who may not be familiar with yourself and the work you do, do you mind giving us a very brief introduction uh, as to what you do? And also, within that introduction, could you tell us why you do what you do as well? Okay, um, I struggle with this question because I think it boxes us. So I'm going to try and answer it as, as humanly as possible. So um, I was once described by somebody as a human geographer, which I quite liked because my mum always used to say I was very nosy as a child. And I have reframed that as curious. So I've always been curious about human beings, about people. Um, and that's led me to doing anti-racism education. And so I do many things. I'm a TED speaker. I'm a professional speaker by trade. I do consultancy for brave and socially conscious corporations and I have an anti-racism course um, called Becoming Anti-Racist with Nova Reed and a book called The Good Ally which encourages people to go on an anti-racism journey um, so that they can transform and heal and that we can live with less racism in the world um, and so it was really a calling if I'm honest I, I don't think I genuinely don't think any black woman or would would really choose to put themselves in positions where they're exposed to so much hostility on a regular basis. Uh, so I genuinely feel like I, I am being called to serve something that is greater than me and that this is in service of our collective healing and shared humanity. Um, and then, you know, when I'm not doing anti-racism stuff, I guess I'm a creative at heart. I'm an entrepreneur and I'm a creative through and through. I like producing things. I have a podcast. Um, uh, I've got a few things in my back pocket. I've done a documentary film before. So I love I love creating. And, and it's just that some of that creativity has led me to write a book and produce a course um, and do talks and things. Amazing. Thank you very much for that very comprehensive intro. Uh, so to kick things off, Let's just start off by taking it back to who Nova Reed was as a child. So could you just paint a picture as to what your childhood was like, maybe where you grew up, what the environment was like? Yeah, yeah. Um, the environment was very white. <laughs> uh, I grew up in Hertfordshire. I mean, in, in, in Watford, Hertfordshire specifically. It looks very, very different now. It's much more eclectic um, and less monolithic than it was when I grew up. But at the time, it was very, very white. Um, I am from a, I have lineage loss of slavery. I, my, my background is Caribbean. I am from Caribbean heritage and it, that means something. Um, and so the assignment for my family was to fit in and to assimilate. Um, and so my character as a young girl was very quiet. I, I didn't speak unless I was spoken to. I was very anxious. Um, I've always been curious and nosy, quietly curious. Um, and I was actually really, really shy. I don't know when things changed and I ended up doing things like public speaking and acting. But if I'm honest, I think there were probably, you know, it's much easier to, pr to play and be somebody else than it is to be yourself. So in that respect, I'm not surprised I ended up in acting. But actually, as a, as a young girl, I was very, very shy. I didn't like being visible. I... Um, you know, don't speak unless you're spoken to. Um, yeah, I was also, you know, with people I was comfortable with, I was very playful. Um, yeah, that's a few things. It's quite interesting you say that you were very quiet and shy growing up and then now you spend a lot of your time delivering talks and talking yeah. to people and organisations, which is a, a, a vocation that you wouldn't necessarily typically associate with someone that's quiet and shy. Hmm. Uh, that's what I mean. It's only in, in, it's only in you asking me what was I like as a child that I actually remembered I was really shy, and I think part of that was because I was uh, I had really low self esteem, and you know as you as I've grown I've worked on that. Um, 
but there is definitely something in in you know doing acting and dancing and how that encourages you to come out of your shell and i think there's also a layer of you know particularly with acting you get to be someone else is there a period of, period of time where you started to see that shift from coming out of the the quiet shy shell into the person you are now i don't know it, it, i guess it was gradual it's just it's, it's with time it's with um you know finding your sense of self um and and being reaffirmed by not just family but but peers and and just you know discovering who you are a bit more I think that, that was just part of it and I think that comes with just just growing up and I I ended up really enjoying drama my drama teacher was amazing I had other teachers that were shockingly shit which I think <laughs> contributes to whether or not you like a subject or not at school but my drama teacher was a really lovely human being and I really enjoyed it and and I you know that that will definitely have played a factor into how much of me I dedicated to it because I felt like I belonged in drama class and I enjoyed the playfulness of, you know, being the complete opposite of who you are day to day. Like, I really enjoyed that. <laughs> Would you say the drama was an important facet, especially in your upbringing or maybe in some of your early years in, in your personal journey of self-discovery? I think drama and dance because um dance more so I did both it it I was able to express myself without words which I really appreciated though you know I uh you know it's it's very embodied it's you know you're allowing your body to do the expression and the 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 communicating for you so that was a that was a great avenue for me and then the drama I think it just you know and I would recommend that any young person does drama because it really does help bring you out of your shell and help you learn how to communicate in a in a safe and contained way and to play and explore um and you know there's things like drama therapy that are proven to really help with mental health as well so yeah i i, I really value drama and i and I, I i think schools under underestimate how important that is for young people as a vocation for sure. I think schools definitely downplay the arts in general. It's never, it's not necessarily seen as a core subject, but the way you're explaining it, I've never heard of drama therapy before, to be honest. And the way you're explaining it sounds like uh, just arts in general is what I'm getting can be very, very crucial um, in helping young people to come out of their shells, discover yourselves, explore that creative side of us that we don't necessarily tap into too much, especially with the way the education system set up. So um, yeah, that's, that's really good. No, thank you for sharing that. When you were growing up, what was the plan? What was the career goal? Oh, my gosh. So when I was very young, it was to be a hairdresser. And the only reason it was to be a hairdresser, I would say the only reason, a reason that I think made that choice as a young girl so prevalent for me was because they were the only roles I saw people who looked like me, black women. And so I thought, well, I could do that. Um, but as I as I as I grew older, um, I always wanted, and and this is because of the drama I had early days. I always wanted to be an actress. I always wanted to be an actress and professional singer, and I did for a short while. It was my career for. I'm trying to think now. When did I graduate? Um, my career for about seven or eight years, and um, it was also where I first really started to discover racism at work and um i really struggled with it because you know st performance art is very much about what you look like and i was getting so many blocks to roles or, or or going for roles as a tick box exercise when they really had no interest in casting somebody black or going for roles getting down to the last two and being told by casting directors that they've decided to go for someone with lighter skin like they were so brazen in their racism back then um and it corroded my confidence because I was the messaging I was hearing is that there's something inherently wrong with you while you're not getting work. It's it's your fault. It's your it's the it's the it's the tone of your skin, and therefore something that I cannot change. And um, it, it was really difficult. It corroded my confidence. Um, I also danced professionally as well, and I ended up with a an, an injury, an, a hamstring and back injury. Um, the two are linked. 
And um, it got to the point where I really started to think about if this was a viable career option, just because work was so sporadic and, and limited as a black creative. And also, like, I was feeling the toll on my body. Um, pay wasn't particularly good. I wanted security. <laughs> and I was like, I'm not sure how viable this is. I, I mean, I'd studied a degree, so I did have other things to fall back on. Um, but I found the the racism within that industry absolutely corroded my confidence. Um, and so as a combination of that and constant, what felt like constant injury, I retrained um as a well I did it a lot I didn't retrain as I did it alongside so I was supplementing my income at the time as a re remedial massage therapist so I had a lot of clients who were dancers and you know I used to do massage for marathon runners and things so I was always interested in the body and then you know people just generally start opening up to you when you're when you're in that in level of intimacy with somebody and I've always liked being curious about human behavior and the injuries led me to start temping for an organization that worked with student student mental health and the students would always come to me they would always you know they felt safe with me they felt like they would be heard and and respected and so it was then that I retrained in mental health um, and counseling skills and I was doing that part-time alongside still um doing bits and bobs of acting i did a lot of singing like session singing um and so it just kind of found me really it's yeah i can't actually remember your original question but... <laughs> <laughs> no, it's okay um, i think the question what i was asking you about what you wanted to be when you were younger yeah i always wanted to be an, an actress like that, that that was the big goal that was the you know if i if i get on stage in the west end i've made it and um, it just turned out to be a very different experience than that, how it was romanticized. And so I became, I became quite jaded with it. You know, I listened to your TED talk and you spoke about the first racist experience you remember when you were five years old. And then after that, then whilst you didn't divulge too much into other experiences, you spoke about people waving England flags, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. And then... Now, as you're talking, you're talking about when you was in more, well, a lot more involved in the acting world and then experiencing that racism as well from cast and directors or whatnot. And it seems like you've experienced a lot of very, very overt experiences yeah. of racism as well. It's not, not even like very, it's very like in your face experiences. Very. And at the start in your intro, you spoke about with the work you're doing now, it's not nothing that somebody would typically look at and want to do. You're facing a lot of hostility, hostility sorry, in your line of work. It's like you faced hostility in different ways, shapes and forms throughout your life. How do you deal with that, all of that? It's, it's a fine balance. So I'm, I'm at the stage now where, I, and I think the, the um, exposure to more hostility in the past two years has come as a direct result of me being a published author. So before that, it was more controlled. I have autonomy over who I choose to work with. I generally work with people who are open and engaged in the dialogue already and actually want to do the work rather than debate it. And so those spaces are a lot more um, progressive and therefore transformative and therefore safer. But when your profile is raised as a public figure and you have a book and you have to promote the book, you're being exposed to everyone. And I definitely have seen the impact of you know, being in more hostile spaces or dealing with more racism on a regular basis since since my book published than when I had a bit more control over it. But, you know, how how do I cope? Um, I, 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 I'm very boundaried. I, I say no more than I say yes. Um, I have rest days in my working week as part of my working week. Um, I, I have a, a team of people who support me most of them are volunteers and those who volunteer are um, students who have completed my anti-racism course and are giving back and are um, being reparative and so what I have them do is they field my emails so if any racism comes into my emails I don't even see it they're dealing with it they're protecting me from it so I have buffers like that um, and you know it, when I can, I, I try and take, you know, extended periods of rest, particularly over this time of year when my body is like, no, nah, I'm not, I'm not up for it. I really try and tune into what my body needs. And this time of the year for me as a black person living in Britain, 
is a struggle. So I try and do less work. I, def I don't do any speaking work between December and March, which is public facing work. Um, I'm very introverted at this time of year. And I, you know, I, I prioritize my well-being. I, you know, boundaries are a part of that, but saying no is a part of that. Um, but, you know, being intentional with the food that I put in my body, um, surrounding myself with people who who have a shared experience, um, doing things that nourish me, like seeing, you know, going to see specific black art or where art where I'm represented, going to see live music shows, um, being with friends, like good soul food. Um, I like painting, so I paint a lot. I'm not good at it, but I love it. <laughs> um, you know, I, and I laugh a lot. There's even though even though I'm in this, you know, I'm in a a, a difficult space. Um, I'm still quite playful, uh, and and that playfulness haven't hasn't really gone away, which I'm grateful for because it could have. Uh, I love that answer, and it sounds as if you found a nice balance within your life yeah. right now. You've got the work you do, which is big, massive, impacting a lot of people, educating a lot of people, and then you've got also you've found ways in which to uh, to bake into your schedule ways in which to protect yourself, to look after yourself, to do things that you enjoy, nourish yourself a bit. Do you have any major challenges right now in your life with your work that, that you're, you're working on overcoming? There's always major challenges when you're dealing with white supremacy. And I think many of us who are black would have experienced this after what I and others like to call Black Square Summer, where you, you had this flurry of white peers, colleagues, friends, standing in solidarity or, or, or saying that they're standing in solidarity for black lives, putting these black squares on Instagram, organizations putting statements on their websites. And I think some of their intentions were genuine. And I think what's happened is people, they want a magic pill with dealing with racism. They want to deal with it quickly once and then carry on with their day and not feel um, inconvenienced or confronted. And when they realize what is really at stake and that it's not about denigrating those white people over there, it's about actually as a white person, let me look inwards. How am I, how am I complicit in this? What does my racism look like? How does my racism, when I roll my eyes, when a black person says they're experiencing racism and my reflex is to not believe them, how does my racism show up when there's, there's blatant anti-blackness in a WhatsApp group with family and I collude and I start laughing? Because it means they have to do something about it. It means they have to look at their own stuff, deal with whatever shame or guilt comes up, start having conversation with partners, parents, grandparents, peers. Um, and not everybody is up for that. So the challenges I face is, and, it, and it's, not, it's not the majority, I need to preface that, but nevertheless, it still has an impact on me. But they'll come into my space, they will, you know, read my book, um, parade around the internet, oh, I've read Nova's book, and position themselves in a certain way, do the course, and then nothing else. It's a tick box. It's not sustained, it's not continuous. And so my challenge is with white liberals who maintain that they are anti-racist, who, who cannot and will not be held accountable when their racism shows up and then start blowing their shame and their rage and their frustration and their embarrassment at you highlighting their racism through you. And I find that more harmful than dealing with somebody who is overtly racist because one minute they're on side and then the next they're not. Uh, it's It's very... I, I'm going to name it as it is. I find it very abusive. Um, whereas somebody who's overt in their racism, at least they're being honest about who they are and what their beliefs are and what their values are. And so I can make a conscious choice to avoid that person or engage with them. It's harder when it's your friendship circle or, you know, the people that you have to work with every day. Yeah, for sure. And on that, actually, so you spoke about with some white liberals, maybe they've done read you know, read the book or done some work but then the effort isn't sustained same with these organizations who have done black square summer etc but then uh the sentiment or the effort isn't sustained so on that i'd like to caveat a bit onto allyship so clearly i mean obviously you've written the book the good ally and with those examples we've spoken about they're i guess clearly not examples of good allyship you may have done some level 
of educating yourself, but then there isn't any action or sus- you know, it's not sustained afterwards. In your eyes, what is a good ally? What makes a good ally? Well, I um I address this pretty pronto in my book, in the introduction, uh, that actually being anti-racist is not about being an ally. It's about being a better human being. It's about treating, specifically in my lens, treating black people uh, with basic dig- dignity, care and respect, which are all the things that didn't happen to us historically and to this very day for many of us still. Um, you know, you know, with, with 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 the transatlantic slave trade and the millions and millions of Africans who were enslaved, they were written in law as subhuman and treated as chattel slavery. That hasn't happened to any other human community, and that kind of denigration and social persecution and dehumanisation for centuries has a ripple effect on how people treat us to this very day. So, to me, being an ally is about being a rehumanising us and being a better human being, and actually healing from the horrors of our history because they're horrific not denying that they happened or that they were a long time ago but accepting that they happened and recognizing how that you know shape shifts and exists today and taking personal responsibility so that there's some kind of collective effort to change so that that's that's how i frame allyship i I think the term since black square summer has been totally bastardized so i started writing the good ally in 2018 and um, interestingly enough, we, we had some interest with three, three of the top five publishers and I had some meetings in 2019. And one of them was really keen to, to take it. And, um, you know, when a, when a publisher is interested in your book, there's a little, there's a, I mean, it takes forever, to be honest. It's a long process. <laughs> um, but when they're really interested, it goes to something called an editorial meeting and then it goes to acquisitions. And acquisitions is where, like the sales team, the marketing, everybody in senior positions are involved in deciding if this book is sellable and what they might offer you as an advance. And so it was it was in those phases and um, the editor that I was working with was certain that we'd get a deal and um, the team hated it. They said it was patronizing and they said the bit that makes me laugh was that there isn't a market for this book in the UK. This would have been, so my first meeting would have been March 2019 and we had meetings all over summer, so summer 2019. And then fast forward to summer a year later, all these publishers are scrambling around, loads of them are in my inbox. (laughs) (laughs) Um, But yeah, I I actually secured a deal of the Good Ally in April 2020, so that was before the murder of George Floyd and and, and didn't accept until uh, several months later. But it was interesting seeing the appetite for this work changed. But what happened is there was just a bastardization of allyship. It was more about being seen to be looking a certain way and being seen to be a good white person and not one of those dodgy white people over there putting knees on black men's necks. And it was it was more about perception than actually this has been an issue for centuries and decades and I'm well aware of the anti-blackness that's rampant in society and I've done nothing about it. And rather than approach it with that level of integrity and honesty, it was more about this badge of honour. Well, how can I position myself with the closest black person to me so that I can feel a little bit less guilty? So what do you say when you're talking to people like that? Also on top of that, so with the kind of work and the audiences you speak to, um, I'm just imagining in my head that you've got a couple groups of people. So you've got the group of people who are willing who maybe may have read a bit, may have watched a bit, but they, they, they're willing to listen and to learn. Then you'll have a second group of people who don't care, don't think it's an issue, don't want to learn. You know, they're, 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 just, they're not really interested, really. How do you approach people like that? The ones who, you know, they're, they're not really wanting to take it on board, not really, not really. They're just there maybe because they've been forced to be there. How do you explain to them why this is so important? I, I don't anymore is the answer, Tevin. I, I, I'm just like, I'm not going to debate or explain to you why my humanity is deserving of your attention or deserving or why I'm deserving of being treated with basic dignity, care and respect. Like I'm not having that dialogue with you. That's a starting point. Go and talk to somebody else. So I genuinely don't. And for the most part, the organisations that I'm being asked to speak at, um, I mean, there's a way of managing it. I'm generally like, you know what you get with me. So I think organizations book me 
knowing that I will be very, very honest and open and I will name white supremacy in the room and I will talk about shame. So they know what they're getting with me. So I tend to work with organizations that have quite a progressive set of values already instilled in the company. Um, but that doesn't stop, you know, that doesn't stop the bullshit. Um, and the way that I've learned to manage it the hard way is I rarely do training now. So if people want to engage me, they often will contact me and say, well, can you come to our organization and do some training for our senior managers? And my answer is no. Um, I said, I've got a self-directed online anti-racism course. You engage with that. You complete that within six months. And then we can have another dialogue about whether this space is safe for me or not as a black woman and whether people are open and willing to learn. So that's helped. So I have people from the NHS doing my course. I have people from school uh, teachers, um, educational, uh, educational psychologists, um, CEOs at certain organizations. And that for me is the essence because they need to do their work first. And I don't need to be the recipient of their anger, their rage, their discomfort. I don't need to experience that. Like you do your work <laughs> um, and have other white folk or, you know, other folk doing this work with you to hold you accountable, work through all that, that, that's tough stuff. And then we can get to a, a phase where we can have a dialogue about it rather than defending position. Um, and then the way I, I handle it when I am in, you know, if I'm doing a large speaker gig. Um, so for example, I was at South Bank recently and I, one of my boundaries is I don't take questions from the audience. So I don't give people an opportunity to, to be racist to me. Um, I barely do book signings. I mean, I do sometimes. And if I've got, if I do book signings, there is a bodyguard next to me and there is a clear piece of instruction that Nova's not answering any questions. So there's some boundaries there that help keep me safe and also manage expectation. Like I've just delivered a, an hour talk for you and given you a huge amount of value. You're not extracting anything further from me unless it's on my terms. Where do you, do you feel like as a society, based on your experiences growing up and then where we are right now, very much involved in the work you're doing, do you feel like we've made progress in the right direction? I think it depends what the, the, what's the benchmark, what's the success criteria. Do you see what I mean? Like compared to what, what's the, what's, what are we comparing it to? Because if we're comparing it to, you know, chattel slavery, then yeah, of course we've made progress. But if we're comparing it to, well, you know, black women are still four times likely to die in childbirth. That's been a statistic that's been rampant since 2000 and, and is predicated because a lot of, gynecology was founded in medical racism um so no we haven't made progress there um and you know what what how are we doing with black men and and the disproportionate number of stop and search that's been an issue since sus laws were introduced so no we haven't made progress there so that question very much is like what's the what's the criteria for success what are we comparing what are we comparing progress to i want to talk a bit more on the corporation side of things i read something just today so, you know, with Elon Musk taking over Twitter and he's fired almost yeah. half the workforce. Oh, yes. Yeah. And I read today that he's fired all of the, he's ended all the, the diversity groups, the employee resource groups. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. So he's fired. I read it in one source. So whether that's final, I, I can't say, so don't quote me, but it, it looked like a credible source I read it in. So he's fired everybody in the women's resource group and in the race resource group. The race group, I think was called Blackbirds and the women's group, I think was I don't know, Twitter women or something like that. I can't remember. But then they're, they're done. He's disbanded them. Wow. So the question here is, what do you feel like, one, these kind of resource groups within um, large global organizations are important? And what, what do you think about organizations when they're looking to cost cut, look into these kind of places as the first point of call to cut and fire and get rid of people? I mean, you know, if, 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 what, you know, if that is, if, if that is accurate, um, it is certainly not isolated. And, um, I think it just communicates very loudly where the values of that organization were to begin with. And actually when, when something is birthed, you know, when a, a women's network or, you know, a race network or a LGBTQ network is, is, um, created because there is something public that happens and they feel that they need to do something like the intention behind that was never about actually how do we provide 
um, uh, uh, you know, how do we start creating psychologically safe spaces for our staff? How do we better look after staff well-being for people in, you know, socially persecuted groups? Like, how do we care about them and value them more and recognize that when you've got a healthy body of staff who feel like they belong and like they can contribute, that has a direct impact on sales, that has a direct um, impact on how you create and how you innovate. But no, it's more about the token box. It's it's the performative aspect. It's the performative allyship aspect. And so to me, when they're the first, you know, there are cuts and they are the first people that go, that highlights to me very, very clearly where the value is in that organization in terms of, 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 of inclusion. Um, and in terms of the these network groups, I... I think they serve an important purpose in creating that safe space where there is shared um, shared reality, shared experience, and a place to um, be honest and be yourself and to to be witnessed and validated. Where I think they can fall short is if they don't feed into sen senior leadership because if it's just a little network on the side or when senior leadership say to staff members that they can't take time off, I say time off, it's not time off, it should be seen as part of what's required to stay well at work. Um, I think it's a problem when these networks don't feed into HR or senior leadership so that when things are flagged, that there is a follow up and things are being addressed and taken seriously. Because otherwise, it's just a little it's a get together and nothing really changes within the culture. So I think they're important, but you know, how they, the function of them, I think is, is really important to ascertain. Yeah. No, thank you for that. And definitely, I definitely wholeheartedly agree with the first point you made about the values. Cause if that's the first point, first thing to go, then it goes back to what do we stand for? What does this organization exactly. stand for? It kind of, it tells you what they stand for. That's the first thing to go. So thank you for that. With all of the work you're doing, what kind of a world and society do you envision? Ah, it's a nice question. Um, I, I talk a lot about hope in my work um, because what I'm asking people to do is believe in the unimaginable. Because you know, you just spoken about my journey as a as a as a human being, and 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 that has been touched by racism throughout. The youngest experience I had of racism was 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 seven that's my my youngest memory that's what I remember I'm sure there were experiences before that and whatever I experienced in my mum's womb um because there's you know there's so much research it shows you know trauma is passed down from womb to womb um but it's been it, it's been it's been punctuated by it so it, it's difficult to imagine something different because it's always been there um so I'm asking people to lean into hope and believe in the un and believe in the unimaginable because there are definitely you know there are lots of moments we experience as black folk where we're not being subjected to racism or othering and they are light and they are easeful and they are nourishing and they are joyful and they are abundant um and so it's more of that and and the excitement of seeing you know who we are becoming and who we will become without having to deal with all of that stuff on top. Like we'd have so, you know, the energy, I just imagine having so much more energy uh, to create or to just be, um, to play. So yeah, it's tapping into those moments where, you know, we, we, we are just free to be ourselves because we have those moments and it's just wishing for more of that. Definitely, more time to, to create, to paint, to dance, to make music run, laugh, dance, whatever, you know, time, time to tap into your inner child. That's amazing. Thank you. And what would you recommend if there's anyone that's interested in becoming a better ally, a good ally, what can they do? Um, any people, organizations they can support or what steps should they be taking? Mm, again, this kind of question is a little bit like how long is a piece of string? Cause it depends on who they are. It depends on what their circle of influence is. Um, one of the things I talk about a lot is how, you know, either individuals who are doing social justice work, and there are a lot of individuals doing social justice work, or grassroots organizations that are doing social justice work, we generally really find it very difficult to access funding to support our business so that our business is resourced with whether that's staff, 
whether that is, uh, you know, expertise, mentoring, um, or just, you know, financial resource, very difficult. We're having to apply to the same institutions that discriminate to get money. <laughs> it's outrageous. There was a, there's a statistic I often talk about that, um, you know, we have a lot of black black people who are running their own businesses and contributing a significant amount to the British economy and doing, you know, running great businesses. And um, I think the 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 statistic I'm talking about was between 2009 and 2019 of venture capitalist funding. And so where all the funding went out to all these business owners, only 0.024% of funding, can't remember what the pot of money was, you can find the stat online, went to black female business owners over a 10 year period. So that shows you the deficit. We're out here, the majority of activism historically and to this day is being done by black women. And yet we have lack of access to resource and there's this disproportionately impacted. So if you're somebody who works for an organization or you're somebody who has wealth privilege and you want to be an ally, one of those things you can do is in, in reparative is, right, okay, how much financial resource can I give? Or do I have a skill set where I can mentor somebody? Or do I know somebody who is an angel investor? Or can I put a good word in here? That's a very specific way that somebody might be able to help. Um, Lots of people who are doing this work are often really fatigued or burned out. Um, there was an initi initiative, I can't remember the name, it's in my book, but it was in Cornwall. And they reached out to help survivors of Grenfell. And they wanted to give respite to surviving family members and people who'd been impacted by that. And also for the firefighters. And they donated accommodation, food, a holiday free of charge. So that's something. Um, but then like the person, you know, the biggest amount of things you can do to be anti-racist is to go on your own personal journey. Because once you start that, you'll then know where you can add value and where you can add influence. And that might be a teacher that's doing my course who is um, in a position of power at a school and is a history teacher. And instead of just having this 31 days of black history in October, She's embedded key people who are black, who have invented, who are scientists, who are creatives, who are, um, you know, uh, like, I think it's Ivory Banglehead Lady, like talking about Romans who are also black and letting people know that we didn't just appear off of the Windrush ship or, or as a consequence of enslavement. And that black people have been, you know, every... Every human being comes from a black woman. And so they're teaching a more holistic history. Um, and they are intentionally seeking out positive stories of, of black people and not contributing to trauma porn. So that's something that she could do because of who she is. So it varies. And what I would say is have the courage to go on your personal journey. You know, my the good ally is, is, is a resource. Um, my anti-racism course is a resource and there are lots of other resources as well there are plenty of resources for people to get started on this journey on but you just have to decide and commit that's amazing thank you for that thank you for that so let's uh quickly talk about you let's talk about nova right now what are you grateful for and why uh i am I am grateful for experiencing um, what I, I describe as the healing power of unconditional love. Because I am not a perfect human being and I have, I have not always felt deserving of many things, including love. And I, and I receive that. I, I receive that not just from my husband, but from strangers on the internet who see the value of the work that I'm doing and will pour into me with words of affirmations or they will send a care package with candles in <laughs> or, um, you know, when I was writing my book, someone offered me to stay at their home, which was by the seaside so I could be resourced and, and they didn't charge for that. Or, you know, more recently someone asked me what I need and I said, I'm, I'm really exhausted. I haven't experienced exhaustion like this and I, I really just need to rest. Um, and they said, I'm going to fundraise money so you can have a sabbatical. And that was, they were just asking me what I needed and I named it and they wanted to do that for me because they saw that I have value and that I'm deserving and that, you know, 
when I'm rested, how I show up in the world is different. And they wanted to give back. And um, I only think people are able to do that kind of community care when they really, you know, they're doing it because it's unconditional. They don't want anything from you in exchange. And that's rare for me as a black woman. It's always, you know, it's always been transactional. And so I think that's a gift, um, being here, being present, being healthy, um, being alive. I have a lot of gratitude for that. I've lost people that I love who are, who are my age. Um, and I'm grateful for, you know, I'm, I'm grateful for my shared humanity in the black community. Um, you know, I, 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 I love us. <laughs> I love our joy. Um, I love our, our humanity and how we can just look at one another and just know. Um, and that is something that I'm very, very grateful for. That's lovely. Thank you for that. And final question, as we just prepare to wrap up. What's next for you? What's the next chapter in your story? Rest. <laughs> <laughs> I'm having some rest. And, you know, when, when I rest, lots of ideas come. I've, I've got a tentative audio project that um, centers black stories that I'm, I'm hoping will get over the green line um, that I'm really excited to do. And I, 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 I want to do more storytelling. You know, I'm, a, I'm curious. Um, I'm interested in people. Uh, my my background is on stage, and so I want to do more um, documentary storytelling, and you know, get creative in in that way. Um, and so I'm looking forward to opportunities as they arise. But firstly, I'm a rest. <laughs> <laughs> Great, that's perfect. Rest, rest, rest. Can't get enough of it. So that's that. Thank you so much for coming to the podcast. I really, really enjoyed um, speaking with you. Now I learned a lot actually. So. Thank you so much. It was amazing. Amazing oh, discussion. I've enjoyed it too. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Uh, as we prepare to, well, as we're closing up right now, have you got any last words you want to share? And also, if people want to keep up to date with yourself and the work you do, how can they best do so? Uh, just a loving affirmation to remind any black women listening that black women are divine. Um, and if people want to connect with me and find out more, I'm mostly on Instagram, um, at Nova Reed, R E I D official. I'm also on Twitter at the moment. I'm not sure how much longer I'm going to be there with all this Elon Musk foolishness, but for now it's at Nova Reed, R E I D Fish, O F F I C. Cause it wouldn't let me have more characters. Um, and my website for people who are interested, I've got lots of things on there. I've got, um, some brilliant interviews I've done with people like David Harewood and, Alex L, who writes a lot about healing and um, a queer black Buddhist called Lama Rod Owens, where we talk about anger and healthily releasing anger, all on my website. So um, if you visit Nova Reed, N-O-V-A-R-E-I-D dot com um, and have a play around there, click the explore button. Um, there's lots of me there and some things that will resource and nourish you. And of course, if you would like to engage in anti-racism work, then... The Good Ally is out now and uh, my online anti-racism course, Becoming Anti-Racist with Nova Reed, is also on my website. Perfect. Thank you so much once again for coming to the podcast. Really appreciated it. Dropped a million gems and I learned a lot and above all, just had a lovely conversation with you. So thank you so much for coming on. If you are listening, please do leave us a rating and review. Subscribe, like, wherever it is listening to this. It really helps us to amplify the amazing voices of these inspirational guests we get on. and helps us expand our reach so that we can amplify all of these amazing stories um, out there. There's way too much negativity. We need to do more to put out some more positive stories. So please do help support us in any way you can. Rate, review, like, share, subscribe. But that's that for now. Thank you so much for coming to the podcast, Nova. This is 1000 Voices. We had the amazing Nova Reed. And for now, everybody, we're out.